Hello, good evening and welcome. This is Biz First Reveal 360, your weekly roundup of the top business news and developments impacting the economy. I'm Nadim Maji. Three events dominated the headlines in the business community this week. The Hamantha Report deal, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation strike and the Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2017. We'll be joined by the Chief Economist at the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce who organises the Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2017 later on in the show to talk a bit about the outcomes of that summit. But before that, here's a quick recap of this week's top stories. Justice Minister Vijay Das Rajpaksa told a packed economic forum that the Board of Investment should be shut down. He charged that the institution has destroyed legitimate local enterprises by allowing BOI registered companies to engage in business activities. I know what is happening in the BOI. Now all, most of the business community who are trying to do all their business in a legitimate manner have been always obstructed by this BOI registered companies. And so much, so many items comes, mostly some food items, maybe rice or kuratang and various things, mungata, for some uh, animal farms. But those products have been sold for the human consumption in our local market. Then recently we are having problem about the paper. The prices have gone down, the people are on the street. Early it was 1000 rupees a kilo, now it has come down to 700. Why? That is because of BOI. Then they import from Vietnam for the purpose of value addition and they sell it, half of them are sold in the local market. And when they get the approval for 500 houses, building project, that company built 200 houses. But all the other products, materials, the uh, building materials such as tiles, maybe uh, toilet uh, commerce and things like that, then they are sold in outside market and no duty, nothing. We have suggested to close that, that has no use for this country. It's a barrier for economic development. However, Minister of International Trade, Sujiva Sena Singha, said that the government has sought the support of the Harvard University to restructure the BOI. As he said, BOI uh, is, has become more of a regulator, more than a facilitator. And that's what we're trying to change. The attitude has changed and, the, and the, from top to bottom, uh, uh, it's not working. So with the Harvard team, with the Harvard uh, University, uh, the initiative, they are uh, spending about six million dollars. So we are trying to uh, restructure BOI so that it can be a friendly facilitator uh, for the future. So it would be actually, we are trying to give them teeth also. BOI had been a bit of a dormant institution for a long time. When they started it was really working well. But we are working on it. We are in the verge of actually, uh, there is a private sector, all of us have got together. So in about a month's time, we had a, we'll have a restructural program for BOI. A port worker trade union called off a planned strike as the government labelled this week's petroleum trade union action as being politically motivated. The government took a tough stand and used law enforcement to arrest 16 petroleum workers who ignored an essential service order which had banned the strike on Wednesday. <laughs> We plan to launch a trade union action against the decision to sign the agreement on the Hamad report on the 29th of this month. We planned a trade union action together with the workers of the CPC. Officials have scheduled a meeting with the CPC for next Tuesday to discuss the Hamad report agreement. We have also received an opportunity to discuss this issue. Therefore, we have decided to temporarily suspend this action. This trade union, which is planning a trade union action, is acting in this manner outside the port premises. In comparison, they are not a very big trade union. However, if they want to engage in a strike, they had a right to do it. We have no issues. <laughs> They belong to the Ports Authority. 
we will not relinquish that right to anyone. Stay tuned to BizFest Review 360. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the program. The Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2017, organized by the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, was held during a time when Sri Lanka's economy is in a very turbulent atmosphere. What were the key outcomes of this summit? What were the biggest takeaways? To talk about this and more, we're joined by Anushka Vijay Singha, Chief Economist at the CCC. Execute, transform and realize. That was the theme of the Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2017 held this week in Colombo, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce's annual flagship event. So what exactly happened at the Economic Summit and why should we be interested to talk about this and more? We're joined by Anushka Vijay Singh, Chief Economist at the Chamber of Commerce. Anushka, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Can I start by asking you, uh, what were the biggest takeaways from the Economic Summit this year? Uh, Nadim, I think the biggest takeaways was, were anything related to getting stuff done and ideas around how do you resolve uh, uh, issues of I mean, policy and execution because really that was the anchor for this year's summit. It was about, you know, it was reflecting the frustrations, uh, so, so to speak, of the Sri Lankan private sector in uh, the progress of, of executing and implementing. So uh, for me, one of the biggest takeaways that came through uh, different speakers, a running thread was how to execute and really thinking about not a grand master plan where everything is perfectly set out, where the policies are done perfectly and then you roll it out, but instead the value you can gain from having a fairly good framework that makes sense and you've you know, thought through it for the most part, but you get it out there and you iterate very, very quickly with feedback loops. And I think that's a very interesting concept. It came from the principal economic advisor to uh, Prime Minister Modi, who was uh, our guest of honor and a key speaker. It came through um, a partner from McKinsey in London, uh, Sri Lankan, who was actually helping the Sri Lankan government. It came through also from several other sessions where they were saying, you know, let's begin to implement some things which we may not know what all the consequences would be but let's have a fairly decent framework, get it out there, but have very good feedback loops so that you can improve very quickly, continually. Uh, because I think that's some of the delays we're seeing now where um, either it's, uh, it's you know, not coming, not, policies are not getting implemented quickly enough or they're taking a very long time because there are a lot of worries and considerations. So this was a, almost a different way of thinking around policy reform and implementation. One of the uh, sectors that the Economic Summit really focused on was trade. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about trade, and we see uh, today's global trade climate is not uh, necessarily positive. Mm. Uh, we've seen that with the collapse of uh, the TPP negotiations, etc. Uh, what were the biggest takeaways again? What, was, what were the areas of focus when it came to trade? So this this is very interesting uh, session, Nadim, and uh, I was fortunate enough to to have moderated that with a bunch of very good speakers. And uh, these are some of the very questions I posed to them in an era of uh, challenges to globalization or doubts around globalization. Is it a foolhardy strategy for Sri Lanka to follow an open export-oriented model? Overwhelmingly, the answer was it's not foolhardy. Sri Lanka has to do this. There's no other way. And um, uh, you know, I was reminded of the quote by a former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan that uh, to deny globalization is, is like denying the existence of the law of gravity. I mean, globalization is going to happen. It's just that globalization will keep changing the, its characteristics. And now we're seeing how uh, countries are a lot more um, mindful about how they globalize, to what extent they open up, what they do at home to help them be strong in the face of globalization. So some of the messages that came out doing, during this session on uh, creating a smarter trade strategy was that Sri Lanka really needs to do a lot of domestic reforms while looking, at, while looking out, while looking at signing FTAs and trade liberalization. We need to do some of the tough homework here at home, uh, whether it's updating our policies, updating uh, regulations that are holding business back, quality standards, trade facilitation, all of these are domestic reforms that need to happen alongside 
let's say, during the FTAs or trade liberalization. Another thing that came out quite strongly was um, that Sri Lanka might be casting its FTA net too wide and we shouldn't allow it to get even wider. Instead, we should be very focused and strategic on who do we want to sign FTAs with, which regions, which countries. Uh, and this one speaker you know, essentially said, um, you know, we, we seem to be signing FTAs with anyone who wants to sign it with us or anyone who proposes it. Uh, recently, there was a delegation to Bangladesh. So I think um, the, the message there was Sri Lanka, the government and the private sector need to kind of un identify where are the wins for us and then really go after those. Instead of being recipients, we should be more proactive. Are you confident that this session will, will bring about uh, outcome or will at least lay, uh, pave the pathway? towards that outcome of having a smarter, street, smarter trade strategy? I think so. I think so because what this brought out was um, really points that can guide Sri Lanka's ongoing trade liberalization efforts. Uh, there is already a lot of dialogue between the private sector and government and we're hoping to use that channel to get some of these messages out. And I think the government is receptive and they are looking for uh, this kind of input. Uh, but I interesting, another very important point that came out was for a country like ours that's doing three FTAs, FTA negotiations simultaneously and looking to do many more, we need to think about strengthening our trade negotiation capacity. Um, a small country like ours negotiating with bigger countries, um, we need to build that trade expertise. So these are areas in which the Chamber How is really How do you build your forward. trade negotiation? How do you improve your negotiation capacity? So I think there's two ways. One way is making sure you have your armed well. So for that, the government and the private sector have to work closer together because if the negotiating team doesn't have adequate information on the concerns of the private sector as well as adequate information on what are the offensive interests, what, what do we want as the private sector for Sri Lanka's negotiators to go to that other country and say, we want you to open up X, Y, and Z sectors. Now, if the negotiators don't have that information from the private sector, their negotiating position is, is weak. So I think one important part of improving that capacity and the skill is to make sure we give them the right content, because otherwise they're going in there with very limp material. And also yeah, to make sure that they're asking you for the content. I agree. And this is where we've, uh, we've, we've had So you some need struggle. a degree of uh, consultation with the private sector in order for these to be successful. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another ma major, major uh, key area that was discussed at the Economic Summit was mega development projects. And one of the allegations against this government has been that there have been no mega development projects undertaken. Uh, what was the what was the feeling like uh, among the participants and the uh, panelists in this discussion around mega development projects? So in that session, we had speakers from China Merchant Port, from uh, in China. We had uh, Tata Realty who were doing the project in at Slave Island. We had um, uh, Industrial Zone SCZ, Special Economic Zone experts from overseas. Um, so the sense was that the Port City project, the Hambantara project, uh, some of the megapolis-linked uh, projects, those will really be the mega projects that uh, the country can benefit from. I think overall, if I was to summarize some of the views of the panelists, um, it was really that mega projects can have a lot of positive spillovers and they can be a catalyst for growth if managed well. A lot of countries have managed to spur on wider economic activity by some of these uh, projects. Another point that came through was that there needs to be consistency in policy, there needs to be a lot of transparency uh, in ways, uh, in, in the way the government deals with these investors. We had uh, someone from JKH who pointed out also that we need to look at the sustainability and workforce angles in these, in these mega projects. Specifically on uh, Hambantara, what some of the experts uh, who are not linked to the project, we had experts, SEZ experts, they said that it's, it'll be better if Sri Lanka has an all-encompassing SEZ, Special Economic Zone law or legal framework, so that whether it's in Trinco or Colombo or Kandy or Hambantara, wherever SEZs are going to be set up, it will fall under this broad framework. You, mentioned, you mentioned earlier, if managed well, mega development projects can have a lot of positive uh, spillover effects. If managed improperly, what are the negatives? 
What are the negatives of undertaking a mega development project with poor management? I think it will vary hugely depending on the nature of the project. So at one end of the spectrum, not managing it well would mean that the, the domestic private sector don't get a piece of the action. Right? That would be a big, is there a real big risk? reason. Is there a real risk of this happening? Because a lot of the opponents, even, to, even when it comes to trade, because you see, we see uh, uh, strikes, protests, etc., by uh, professionals, medical professionals, uh, by uh, employees of the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, so, uh, by ports, uh, by port, uh, port workers, by harbor workers. Is there, as they believe, is there a very real risk that the domestic uh, operators, uh, domestic workers, uh, uh, well, domestic Sri Lankan uh, workers and Sri Lankan businesses will be excluded from these? I don't, I don't think there was a fear that by design they'll be excluded. And I think it'll be very hard to even implement something like that where by design you exclude the domestic private sector. I think the worry was that whether there are sufficient um, mechanisms to, to, to in place to allow the private sector to participate as tri uh, transparently or as uh, on a living playing field as uh, an international party. So I don't think there was so much uh, uh, a definite view that it's not going to be possible or it's not going to happen that way. Um, but I think there was some concern that you know, for instance, that Sri Lankan companies, domestic companies, uh, need to go beyond just being agents for a foreign implementing party and to be, you know, active JV partners in some of these projects if they are to benefit from it. Um, and I think certainly the other issue was, and this came from the Sri Lankan uh, uh, people who were on the panel, that uh, the more transparent, the more credible, the more clear-cut some of these agreements are or the pathway to these uh, projects are, it becomes you know so much harder to exclude by design. It becomes so much easier to make sure that everyone has a fair shot. But then you also have to think about our private sector. You know how many of our private sector really have that level of capacity, and you know you may be able to count those on uh, the fingers of two hands. So I think it's uh, we also need to be realistic. There are opportunities for the Sri Lankan private sector. If done well, they can latch on to some of these opportunities and just not be agents but be real JV partners. But then again, how many businesses are really ready to play at that level? And I think only time will tell, really. Do you think you need to, do you think the, it is possible for the country to uh, hold until there are enough businesses that are ready? I don't think that's an option, Nadi. I really don't. And I think, you know, so a, uh, a former boss, mentor and friend, late uh, Dr. Saman Kalegam, who we, who we both knew, always got this question on the trade agreements. Folks who said, we have to get our domestic house in order first before we go for FTAs. And he used to point out, and rightly so, that it's only when the FTA talk started, whether it was the SEPA or the ETCA or China or whatever, that all of these groups that had been postponing doing their domestic reforms, including private sector associations, professional bodies that had been postponing getting the act together, that started to get the act together. And as even in terms of agitating government and demanding government to take action, that only happened when this FTA stuff was going on. When the so risk think, of competition arose. Exactly. And I think it's those trigger points that really make, uh, uh, make things uh, progress. And I don't think we have the luxury to do this first and then then the other. These two have to go hand in hand. I, but, you know, bandwidth is not unlimited, so let's hope that we, we manage to do all those uh, quite, soon. quite soon and quite well. Anushka, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really hope that uh, we see the positive outcomes that you're talking about uh, from the Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2017 in the very near future. Yep. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. Thanks. On the other side of this break, is Sri Lanka ready to ride China's 21st century Silk Road, also known as the One Belt, One Road Initiative? Welcome back to the program. What does China's One Belt, One Road Initiative, the Maritime Silk Road, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank really mean for Sri Lanka's economy? Here are a look at some highlights from the Sri Lanka Economic Summit 2017. How 
how uh, does China view uh, Sri Lanka or put Sri Lanka under the framework of the initiative? I think as many speakers already mentioned, Sri Lanka enjoyed a very important uh, position, uh, geopolitical position. I think Sri Lanka is a very important hub in, along the route of the Silken Road and uh, uh, along the Belt and the Road. And also, uh, the uh, Colombo Port City and is also a pilot uh, project of the initiative. So, in this sense, Sri Lanka is very important uh, uh, for China. And you can sign maybe defense treaty with countries along the routes, and you can build a military base. And the second option will be you build uh, new, uh, new ports and also new roads uh, to diversify your trade routes. So, in this sense, actually, I, I'm thinking the one by one road is. Uh, uh, substitute to the military solution. For Chinese cooperation to bring more Chinese employees to Sri Lanka definitely means higher costs. And so if Sri Lanka is able to offer more skilled workers, and I think the, the Chinese cooperation will be happy to employ, uh, employ uh, the Sri Lanka uh, the employees. Before I came to Sri Lanka, I read a very interesting comment, and that also compare uh, Hanban Tota port to Shenzhen. Shenzhen is a, a city, a major city in China, and also a, a special economic zone in, in China. And this is uh, the first uh, city that uh, opened to the uh, uh, foreign uh, investors, and now it turns out to be a, a huge economic success. If we go back to the maritime geography, there were two countries which were major transshipment hubs still some time ago in this whole geography. One was Singapore, the other was Dubai. Colombo has now come up as a major transshipment hub. Now, this obviously means that the quality and the speed with which goods move across the region and across this entire geography is going to hasten it's going to make a major difference to the abilities of uh, countries like Singapore, locations like Dubai to handle traffic. And I think the only way these countries and locations can be a part of the game is to participate as actively as they can in the upcoming infrastructure. And Singapore has the advantage of having had excellent ports and airports, which routinely uh, get ranked among the first two or three across the world. So I think Singapore is looking at this as the next stage for A, upgrading its own infrastructure capacities, and B, also as a prominent investor and a stakeholder, because it's already in conversation uh, on the Belt and Road opportunities that are coming up in different parts of the geography, and I won't be surprised if down the line, we actually see Singaporean companies playing a very prominent role in the projects that take shape through this architecture. China has the capital and also the expertise to, to build infrastructure. That's good for Sri Lanka. But uh, another thing is uh, good infrastructure is only a necessary condition for economic success. It is not a sufficient condition. So for Sri Lanka, and the, in, in able, uh, if you want the Hambatoto port or the Colombo port city to be a huge success, and you need other conditions, uh, such as maybe more stable uh, policy uh, or more favorable terms for uh, foreign investors and you know, uh, more investment on um, education. So for me, an ideal situation will be uh, China has this Belt and Road Initiative, and also Sri Lanka also has a long-term view on the economic development model or plan. So uh, Sri Lanka can link its own plan uh, to, uh, to China's initiative. And, uh, and then you, Sri Lanka can also make a better judgment on whether the project that China offer uh, is what you want. And, uh, and so that we can uh, achieve our win-win situation. The meeting with China was okay, but it's in there they needed, for example, very quick responses. And I remember even uh, dealing with the whole question of Hambantut at one point. Uh, they would ask me when I was in Beijing, okay, now what's this, this, this? And then by the time I get back to Karambo and come back with a reply, they would sort of uh, got tired of the whole thing. 
and this was one major thing. For example, they wanted to develop Hambantota as a city also to really make a point for which shipping can land and rest and so on. And as I mentioned in my uh, words earlier also, uh, the advantages that uh, Colombo provides, Hambantota was not able to do. But Hambantota is still kept as a port that is going to help by China. But I think they have now discovered that Colombo is more helpful in that sense because of the infrastructure and so on it provides. Sri Lanka can use to deal with other major powers such as US, India and uh, Japan, EU and you can try to uh, make a better deal with other uh, countries and uh, Thailand is taking advantage uh, of the competition between China and Japan to acquire loans from China with lower interest rates. So I think that will be a, a a model or, or, or templates for Sri Lanka. And that's a wrap of Biz First Review 360 for tonight. Don't forget to look us up on Facebook. You'll find us at Biz First Review 360, 1ST and 360 in numerals. I'll see you again same time, same place next week. Good night and good luck.